Hi there, Simon from simonwoods.com. Today, Italy. And the theme in Italy is, uh, actually it's all over the place. We've got four different regions. Actually, we've probably got more than four different regions. As the last one, it just says Vino Rosso d'Italia. Uh, so it may be from one particular region or it may be from a blend from several. Um, and we've got different ambitions. We've got some wines that are under a tenner. We've got some wines that are quite a way over a tenner. Let's just dig in and see where we get to. First one is uh, Sassaia Monferrato Rosso 2007. Uh, now we are in uh, Piemonte here and uh, we're in that part of Piemonte uh, where it's not maybe not as uh, Nebbiolo centric as it can be in some parts. Uh, so the blend here, uh, yes there is some Nebbiolo in there but um, if, well, the order that they've got it on the back label, Cabernet Sauvignon, Barbera, Nebbiolo. So let's just dig in and see where we get. Intriguing this because it's like there's um, uh, there's the uh, the fleshy uh, svelte modern bit. There's there's this plushness and there's this uh, uh, there's the Cabernet Sauvignon ripeness and that that's like black currant plumminess. Uh, but then there's the um, uh, there's the awkward Nebbiolo at the back going. What about me? What about me? And having a bit of a growl and having a bit of a herby growl, um, showing some of these more fragrant things. The tar, the rose petals, those type of characters. The Barbera is probably keeping the two apart going. Hey, 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 and in the process being squeezed and uh, releasing some of its blackberry joyfulness. It smells, um, yeah, it smells intriguing, and I, I, I think it's one of those where the, the more it's uh, it's allowed to to be, the more that rustic edge will come through. So at the moment, maybe the uh, the modern edges to the fore. I think the slightly rustic edge will come through, uh, maybe with a bit more swirling. Maybe when I taste it, let's have a see. And it's a similar uh, similar uh, story when you come to taste it. Um, there's the um, there's the berries, there's the plums, there's the richness. Then there's the herby uh, awkwardness sitting in a corner and just maybe sort of slowly going to integrate with the rest of it. At the moment, I find it just a little bit too flashy. Um, I see this vanilla sheen over it, uh, and I'm not quite sure whether that's ever going to calm down enough to let the uh, the more interesting characteristics take centre stage. I can taste a lot of winemaking here. It's, it, I bet they've probably got an overpaid consultant, but. Um, here, I, I like the I, I like the way in which they've not they've not totally suppressed the wild side. Uh, I, it's a rich, juicy wine, uh, honest, steak friendly. I like to have this with a quite a rare ribeye. And um, uh, yes, I've got a feeling that I, I, I can't have it with what we're having tonight. I'm having this, something that's too spicy. So I'm going to leave it. I'm going to try it tomorrow evening uh, when we are on something that's a bit more uh, sassire friendly, shall we say? And uh, I will report back. Yeah, that edge of vanilla, just uh, I, I wish they'd uh, uh, used bigger, older barrels. Um, Campo, right, next one, Campo Giovanni uh, Brunello di Montalcino from San Felice. Felice. Um, and uh, so 100% uh, Sangiovese here. And uh, if you haven't kept up with the stories, there have been a, quite a lot of hoo-ha in recent years about uh, some people putting other things into their Brunello. And uh, there's been also more recently... Uh, who are about whether Brunello's little brother Rosso di Montalcini should be permitted to put other things in there. They check that out, but um, uh, but I mean, Brun great Brunello uh, is one of those wines that uh, is fragrant but warm-hearted. I suppose if you want to uh, have a, a French equivalent, you'd be on things like Hermitage, things that are have got structure and aristocracy, uh, but have also got a little bit of bull's blood in them. Well, having done that great build-up for it, it's actually quite a subtle wine, this. Um, what I, what's great about it is it smells, it, 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 it feels like there is a core of something that's waiting to uncurl. But for the moment, uh, what you're getting is these lovely, uh, a bit, of, uh, bit of tar, a bit of that cola edge of Sangiovese, uh, this gentle fruit, uh, this undergrowth character, uh, there's this warmth and... Uh, it's had, I think, I think it's said on the back, three, average of three years in in barrel. It's not at all an oaky wine. I think that, that time in oak has calmed down uh, a, a, a slightly monstrous wine and uh, has, uh, has made it, um, it's still a bit of a beast, uh, but at the moment it's a very quiet beast. Uh, so it would be interesting to see whether further uh, further agitation and further time it's open, when, it, when it's open it actually reveals more of that beast. At the moment it, it smells it smells really good, really subtle though. Uh, I, know, I'd have, I don't know whether I'd put it as a, as a Brunello uh, I don't think I'd have put it as a Chianti. It hasn't quite got that Chianti freshness, but um, it's, it smells pretty terrific, actually. 
grown-up wine that. Um, it's uh, not afraid to show its uh, oak ageing. Sometimes uh, I, I, I don't like the idea of people shoving a, a wine in a barrel until uh, any, any, any possible fruit character has, uh, has been expunged. But also I think quite a lot of people now whip their wines out of oak just that little bit too early when a little longer in oak would not have made it oakier but would have actually uh, softened it, rounded out its uh, its gawky edges. Um, here it feels, it, it, there's a, uh, I don't know, I, I was going to call it uh, Sangiovese in the style of Rioja Grand Reserva, because uh, there is that uh, slightly, a bit of that, when I say the vanilla sheen, it's not that uh, uh, slightly crude vanilla sheen that I got in the, uh, the you know, upfront vanilla sheen that I got in, in, in the Sassaya. Here it's a more laid back, uh, it's a more knowing, it's a more, I'll, I'll give a subtle wink at you, but you know I'm classy. Um, and uh, a wine that, because it's done that ageing in barrel, and has emerged and has still got freshness, um, you can probably watch it go on and on and on. Today it looks great, uh, I think tomorrow it'll look better, but I think if you've got the patience and can keep it a few more years, it will be even better. I didn't spit that out. Okay, uh, next one. We are on Mio Passo, uh, Primitivo di Puglia. Uh, I think this is the third one I've tried in the Mio Passo range. I've tried a Fiano and what was the other one? A Nero d'Avola? Something like that. Uh, and it's a range uh, done by a guy called uh, Stef um, uh, Stefano Girelli? Um, anyway, one of the Girelli family, who's, who now is no longer with Casa Girelli, um, and he's doing, has got a company called The Wine People, and Mio Passo is a brand that he has developed. The idea is you get good fruit from various parts of Italy and uh, package it nicely. People find a brand that they can recognise, stick with, and uh, get to know more about Italian wine. Because it Italy is a bit of a... Um, the, the, the Italians aren't great about explaining their wines to the rest of the world. It's sort of like, here it is, it's Italian, what's the problem? You should like it. Um, so let's see whether we, we'd like this. Uh, so vintage, uh, has it got a vintage on? I can't see a vintage. There's probably one. Oh, Vendemia 2010 on the neck. Rah, let's open it. Gotcha. Now Primitivo, in case you didn't know, is the um, uh, it's the same as Zinfandel, and it's got that boisterous bramble, berry, and uh, slightly earthy, herby, spicy grunt of good Zinfandel. Uh, it smells like it's going to be fresher. It doesn't feel like they've gone over the top in ripeness. Alcohol 13.5% as opposed to uh, current vogue for Zinfandel, which seems to be 14, 14.5 plus. Um, uh, but also different. Uh, so, well, what happens is you plant a grape in a, in a particular region and it um, adapts to that region. So it may have been the same uh, 150 years ago when they took Zinfandel, when they took Primitivo to Primitivo over to California, but in the time since then it has uh, adapted to the local climate. Here uh, it feels like there's still spice, freshness, and yeah, maybe more freshness than you get in, in typical California Zin. And what's good about it is um, it's characteristic of, um, I, I'm not sure whether it's, it, it's the same with Primitivo, uh, but with Zinfandel what they say is you pick a a bunch of Zinfandel at harvest time and there'll be some grapes that are absolutely perfectly ripe, there'll be some that are overripe and there's some that are on the green edge. One of the problems in California is they try and ripen it so much that the green bit has disappeared by which time the ripe bit has become overripe um, and the overripe bit has become over overripe. Here there's still a little bit of that green herbal character showing that uh, there, maybe there were a few grapes that weren't, uh, yeah, it weren't strictly speaking fully ripe but it's added freshness, it's added spice, it's added bounce. And it's, it's made for a far more food friendly wine than uh, many a Californian Zinfandel. I like that. I like the juiciness, I like the bounce, I like the spice and I want to go out and uh, get some sausage and mash and um, have half a pint of that. No, I'm not supposed to drink half a pint of wine, am I? I never do, honest. Final one. Piccini. Memoro. Vino Rosso d'Italia. Um, now, this is one of those. that It says Vino Rosso d'Italia. Um, and um, what's in it? Well, I'm really not sure. But um, blah, 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 blah. a cuvee wine from our family's Italian pride. Blah, 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 blah. Um, and it's one of those that, that it's got lots of uh, um, semi-folklore tales on the, on the back. Uh, and, uh, but it, it, one thing that uh, made me think I, I, I'm going to have it, uh, have it the last of these. It said, reminiscent of port, but with a dry, complex palate, and so on. Let's, I won't read the rest of the notes, because it might prejudice my tasting for you, dear viewers. Well, we started with one style of oak. 
and we're finishing with a different style of oak. The oak on the first one was that slightly sweet vanilla uh, as if they'd overused pretty decent uh, French oak barrels. Here there's a, a rubbery rawness that suggests that they have misused some uh, maybe not quite as high class barrels. Um, there is fruit behind, there is this, yeah, as ripe. I mean, uh, port-like is, uh, it's, not, it's not that over the top sweet port type of smell, uh, but it does feel like it's a port on, uh, in terms of the fruit flavors on those blackberries, just uh, maybe slightly shriveled up blackberries, m maybe a little, a little bit of um, plums in the same condition as well. Um, but I may be wrong, let's taste it. And it is a big bounder of a wine. Um, and uh, yeah, there's, there's plums, ripe cherries, blackberries, but over the top, it's this oaky sheen. And I didn't smell so much of the vanilla, but the vanilla really kicks in there. Um, I wish they'd had the confidence to not oak it to that degree, um, because it's it, that, that character's taking over the wine at the moment. Maybe it will calm down. Uh, as I say, I'm not drinking a wine, uh, I'm not eating stuff tonight that would be friendly to this um, genre of wine, but um, I'll keep an eye on them and I'll taste them all again tomorrow, uh, because it may be that they surprise me. But I still think, um, uh, I mean, favourites here, the Campo Giovanni, is, is the class act. Um, the Mio Paso is, is pretty good. Uh, my concern is whether the Sassaia uh, calms down. I don't think the Puccini one will do, but I'm very willing to be proved wrong. That's how you learn. See you soon.